Well, I'm going to have a little bit of a, of a big reveal later is that I have a friend on here from high school whom I haven't seen for years and I'll, I'll mention him a little bit later. It's got to be yes, amazing. Yes, Mark. Did you guys all see Mark laughing on there? He has revealed. Yeah. Oh, yes, I see that. <laughs> Mark, show yourself. You know, we're you. popular demand. We do oh. double pay you. Oh, my gosh. That, that is cool. I, it is cool. Yeah. I don't keep up with people from high school. So you do, huh? I do. Uh, I had a number of good friends uh, from when I was younger. And my, and my friend Mark, who you guys can't see, is one of my closest um, friends from that time. Thank you, Mark. Oh, that, that is great. Well, I should tell everyone that we are recording this and we will upload it to YouTube and put the link on the Oasis Facebook page. So um, my name is Barbara, I'm from Oasis. We're hosting this event, but truly Martha Woodruff is the one who curates the, the events. So Martha, may I throw over to you? Absolutely. Uh, I was saying, I have all my, I do all my great thinking in the shower. And in the shower this morning, I was trying to remember how the, I almost said hell, but I'm glad I didn't. I met uh, Erica for the first time. And I want to say it was through her writing. I think I saw an essay of, of hers. And I, uh, I, I, I've posted this on Facebook, but I, I'm a really picky reader and uh, picky about my writing. I have a, 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 a bad, I, I worked as a journalist for a long, long time with some really, really good editors. And uh, Erica is, for me, one of the magic literary writers who is also, I like clarity. I like people who, the writing that's figured out where the authors figured out what they're going to say and they say it in a way that I don't have to stop to be impressed by the writing or don't have to stop to figure out what they're trying to say. And Erica, is one of my favorite uh, favorite writers, and um, she she writes uh, she writes a creative nonfiction, and I love what it says on her website, which I may misquote, but it says I am interested in what people are doing when nobody is looking. And did I get that right? Can can I re can I restate it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Martha. Yes. Uh, so I'm interested in what happens to people when they are not seen, okay. and I'm ha I'm happy to talk about that line later and what okay. it sort of signifies for me. But anyway, uh, I, her, I've I've known her for a long time, and her writing continues to delight me, and I'm really looking forward. I haven't heard anything from home, or the new book that she's working on, and uh, I look forward to it very much. So, here's Erica. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, for showing up today. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, I want to thank Barbara for organizing the series, um, Martha for inviting me to read, um, you know, my, my writing group, one of whom is on this call, Michael Trochia, um, and others in that group who are essentially my editors. They, they hear this stuff first, um, and I, I really appreciate them. Uh, I also want to thank the Valley, Valley Arts Council, who uh, generously gave me a grant to support this project. Um, and then I have two more people, like sort of one general group of people, um, and one specific person to thank. And one, importantly, is my sister Karen, who 
is watching my daughter uh, while I give this online reading. Um, I think she's, I, I don't know where she's taking her, but I'm sure they're fine. Um, uh, I also just want to thank, again, all of you for showing up. Um, as I was saying earlier in the chit chat, one of my oldest friends is on um, this call, Mark Campolito. Um, and I have other friends, obviously many friends on this call, but I want to give a shout out to Cynthia Miller, who has also vetted my writing through the years and who's, who's one of my favorite writers. Um, I have a couple of other um, uh, writers I love uh, here, and, and one is my friend Darcy Corteau, who's a wonderful um, journalist and um, mixes the personal with journalism. She's she's wonderful. Um, and if you know people here haven't heard uh, Lauren Elaine's um, poetry or read her interviews with people, they're really um, quite wonderful. So, um, and I thank friends and colleagues who are here. So, um, Barbara, have you muted everybody? <laughs> because I get so nervous about. I haven't. Um... Why doesn't everyone mute themselves? Okay. Okay. And for those of you just coming on, we are recording this. And then when Eric is ready to take questions, we can unmute ourselves. Okay. Yeah. I'm muting myself. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I've had phones ringing and dogs barking during meetings before. So I just wanted to check. Um, so I am writing a book length letter to my daughter about where she comes from in terms of family and country. And as, as Martha put it in her blurb, the enduring power of, of secrets. Um, and it is, it's a book, she's three right now. It's really a book that's meant for her to read when she's older. Um, I'm going to read three excerpts from the book today, I think. I'm going to watch the time and make sure there's time for you to ask questions, but I'm thinking three. Two of the excerpts are very short and one is um, long. And before I read those excerpts, I'd really like to give you some context about the environment in which this book was born. Um, so my daughter was born in April of 2017, and um, which is to say, um, if we're thinking about that time period, she was really born into a crisis of sorts in this country. Um, child family separation, um, travel bans from anybody coming from a Muslim country, uh, Charlottesville, and that was just in the first eight months. You know, a year later, we have Brett Kavanaugh, and you know where we are now. Um, I really see the current president and his supporters as a manifestation of how the U.S. came to be. Uh, it's a country built on principles of white supremacy um, and also on patriarchy from its very beginning. And to really reckon with that history, um, I guess as fully and honestly as I could personally, I turned inward and began researching my own family and how they contributed to the history of the United States as we came to know it. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. I think there are a couple important contextual things to know about me um, before I tell you sort of the older ancestral history. Um, I grew up middle class in Rochester, New York, um, and I also spent a lot of time visiting my maternal grandparents in Western Massachusetts. So both the landscape and historical landscape of Rochester and um, Western Mass uh, are sort of in the grain of my being. Um, it's also important to know that I did not come from a family that told stories about itself. Um, both sides of my family are what I think New Englanders uh, call buttoned up. Uh, they believe that one looks forward, not back. One doesn't dwell on the past and that that is the healthy and dignified way to be. Um, I also think that that way of being, of, of not dwelling on the past and just looking forward, 
is part of, frankly, a, a, a cultural, and I don't know if it's just American, but um, since I'm sitting in this country right now, I'll just say that it is American, to do a kind of deliberate forgetting about our history and our past and um, things like, you know, suppressing indigenous persons and slavery and things like that. I just, I just, I just think that's a part of, of that whole way of being. Um, I also understand that these silences in my own family um, were cultural, but also personal defenses um, exercised to cover up shame and trauma. So in my family, not until my generation and not actually until me, um, did we start telling stories and digging into the past and any previous generation of particularly my mom's family would consider what I'm about to do a kind of betrayal. So I know in Martha's blurb, she, you know, she spelled out that I am descended from uh, six Mayflower passengers and also I'm a part of the Taft family on my mother's side. Um, I actually didn't know that until I turned about 40 years old, which was six years ago. Um, my mother's cousin, Laura, started sending my siblings and me family trees and photographs that we had never seen before. Um, and it was her mother, um, my great aunt Edie, who had gathered all of this genealogical information um, when she was alive and that now her daughter, Laura, again, that's my, my mother's cousin, Laura, um, was passing on to us. So here's what I learned from my great aunt Edie. We are descended from six Mayflower passengers and Robert Taft, the first known Taft to have set foot in what was once called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He arrived in 1675 or 78, the records differ. Uh, as I said, this ancestry was news to me and actually somewhat um, alienating because I had never identified with that history before. Um, and the materials that, you know, the ancestral materials that I received um, essentially made me aware that I did not know how I came to be in the deeper historical sense. And um, Toni Morrison has a line in an essay called Rootedness that where I'm going to badly paraphrase her, but she talks about how the presence or absence of an ancestor in a story uh, largely determines the success or happiness of that person. And she says that whenever the ancestor is absent, it just kind of leads to disaster. And so I tend to take a lot of my marching orders from Toni Morrison. And so I have since plunged headlong into research, mainly about I'm not going to talk about Mayflower people today, but if you have questions about that later, I'm happy to answer. I'm mainly going to talk about my great, great grandfather in this reading, uh, Gustavus Taft, and the world he lived in, which was the Blackstone River Valley of Massachusetts. And that particular valley is actually known as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, because the birthplace started with the textile industry and that's the industry that he was um, involved in. He essentially patented a number of machines, um, textile manufacturing machines for white and machine works, which was once the largest textile machine manufacturing company in the world. Now, that he patented all these machines might make a lot of families proud, and I, I'm proud in some sense with his sense of ingenuity, um, his grit from everything I've read. Um, but also, you know, I think about Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates's um, essay, which I teach because I also do teach, um, The Case for Reparations, which, which came out a few years back, where he reminds us that, I'm going to quote him here, that the web of slave society extended north to the looms of New England cotton fueled American wealth and the industrial revolution created an economic system that exploits the labor of the disenfranchised, including women, children, immigrants, enslaved persons, 
and later sharecroppers. Coates writes, until white America reckons with the moral debt it has accrued, it will fail to live up to its own ideals. And I agree. So this is the backdrop to the present moment in which I try to speak plainly to my daughter about the stories my family suppressed. Um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, mental illness and intergenerational trauma um, are, are are also a part of this suppression. Um, I'm not gonna talk about those today, but I can, or at least in my reading, but I can, if anybody has questions about them later, I'm happy to um, answer questions. Um, I do mention them here because um, I think that, um, I think that sort of the, the trauma that I experienced in my own family, uh, how am I gonna, how can I put this best? I think that the kinds of trauma that we're seeing on a national scale right now starts in the home. I'll just put it that way um, and, and leave that there. In my own family, uh, abuse and trauma were kept secret and masked under the mandate to be loyal and preserve family reputa rep uh, reputation. And this practice had uh, ramifications through the generations. Um, and what I'm trying to do by bringing these stories to light is heal what I can, you know, both from a personal level and this sort of national story, heal what I can and forge uh, a different path into the future for myself and my daughter. Um, and on a very small, modest scale, it's, this is kind of a country healing project um, for me and a kind of anti-forgetting, I guess. Um, so this is my offering to you. So again, this is addressed to my daughter, so I'm going to be speaking to you, which is her, but I hope it, it touches you as well. We'd gone outside to pick tomatoes. Night was near, crickets singing, end of summer. You reached into the vines and tugged gently on the red and yellow ones. Red and yellow ones. We've got one. Should I start again? Okay. I'm going to start again. And if any, everybody can mute themselves, that'd be great. Okay. We'd gone outside to pick tomatoes. Night was near, crickets singing, end of summer. You reached into the vines and tugged gently on the red and yellow ones. You weren't sure the purple ones could be tasty, so tasty, you said, and filled the bottom of your blue bowl, then plunked down in the grass, popping one after another into your mouth as you looked out, chewing and listening to the crickets on the pulsing edge of dusk. This is what I wanted for you. Beauty in the simple, feeling in all of the senses, safety to say who you are, and love the great foundation. I took out my phone and clicked on video. You knew I was watching. I could see you suppressing a smirk as you kept your gaze on the fence in the middle distance, you holding the smirk, when suddenly you turned to me with a bright mischievous grin and popped the last tomato into your mouth. I want to see, you said, and got up from your place in the grass, then sat down in my lap and settled in. I played the video. You watched and laughed at yourself. Again, you said, so we watched it again. You giggled, though dryly this time, turning quiet. Something about it bothered you. Your chest rose, a sigh seemed to be forming inside you. Where are you, mama? You asked. That's you mean in the video? Yeah, where are you? I'm the one behind the camera, I said and held out the phone to show you the different sides. I'm over here on this side and you are out there. This camera is like a wall with an eye that can only look one way. It can see you, but it can't see me behind the wall looking out at you. Oh, you exclaimed and tapped at the screen to make it go again. You wanna watch it once more, I asked, you nodded. I pressed play and we watched. I could feel you breathing against my chest 
and when it ended, you craned your neck to look at me. Where are you, Mama? You were two, my first and only child. I was 45, both of us beginners. I hadn't had much practice explaining how the world works to a person who is learning so many things for the first time. I care about words and what they do. Words shape our lives. So I've wanted to give you words that could serve as reliable guides, but I don't always have the right words. When you asked, where are you, mama? Here is what I wanted to say. There is always someone you cannot see behind the person you can. So that's the opening of the book um, where I've just taken a video of her and she doesn't understand why I'm not in the video with her. And uh, it's, it's really meant to serve as a, a kind of metaphor for, um, you know, yeah, that there is always someone, you know, behind um, the person you can see at center stage uh, that enabled them to be there. Um, and I also tend to think about these things, as I was just saying, talking about the textile industry or even the textiles I'm wearing right now, like, there, there's someone who grew the cotton for this shirt and there's someone that sewed it together in, in Bangladesh or, or elsewhere. And so I'm thinking about those things um, too. So I'm going to read a longer section about my great, great grandfather Gustavus, who I mentioned earlier, um, Gustavus Taft. Um, I think I've set it up well. I, I do have a little historical bit to give you, but I think I've set it up well enough uh, where how I'm thinking about him working for the textile industry. Um, he did also make truly a fortune um, off of off of that industry. Um, I my mom's family, not during her generation, but um, for two and a half generations before her were quite wealthy. Um, I remember when I learned that, that was a bit shocking because my own mother grew up lower middle class, whereas her own father had grown up in a mansion with servants and a, and a cook and a governess. Um, and the loss of that wealth was something my family never talked about. Um, yeah. So in any case, there's a big chasm there. But I, so I went digging and, and finding out about things. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, my great-great-grandfather, Gustavus. Um, okay. I guess I'll say this before I jump in, is that I feel very lucky in that the Taft family is pretty well documented in this country. So I have been able to find things. Um, and because White and Machine Works, the company that my great-great-grandfather worked for, was such a successful company, um, the Harvard Business Library has the majority of their archives, including two of my great-great-grandfather's travel diaries. They were travel diaries for business, and so I got to look at primary sources, really look at his, his words. So I'm, you're going to hear a little bit of that here. At Harvard's business library, I scoured great-great-grandfather's travel diaries looking for signs of what he thought about the violence human beings that had been inflicted on human beings in the cotton fields. On July 31st, 1869, when Gus was in London, he wrote, went to hear Spurgeon in the morning, Newman Hall preaches in Surrey Chapel near Blackfriars Bridge, Surrey side, unquote. That's all he wrote about Charles Spurgeon, an English Baptist preacher and abolitionist. Your mom had to look him up. American Southerners hated Spurgeon. They called him fat and vain and a Pharisee. In a letter to the Christian watchman and reflector, based in Boston, Spurgeon had written, I do from my inmost soul detest slavery, and although I commune at the Lord's table with men of all creeds, yet with a slaveholder I have no fellowship of any sort or kind. 
Whenever one has called upon me, I have considered it my duty to express my detestation of his wickedness, and I would as soon think of receiving a murderer into my church as a man stealer. The Reverend Dr. Newman Hall, who Gus also mentioned in his diary, was another English abolitionist preacher. People called him the dissenter's bishop. It's a marvelous title, a, define, a divine dissenter. Shall I call you queen dissenter? When you're at the dinner table and you refuse to try, try the broccoli and avocado I give you, and you say, no, queen dissenter, we shall call you that. Anyway, as I was saying, both Spurgeon and Newman supported Lincoln and emancipation in a time when the British government, despite having outlawed the slave trade, supported slavery. Their country's textile industry profited richly from subjugated human lives. I wanted to know what Spurgeon said in his sermon in London that morning of July 31st, 1869. Did it inspire great-great-grandfather? Did it rattle him? How did he know about Spurgeon and Newman? Had he read The Liberator or The North Star? Was he a subscriber? Had he ever gone to hear abolitionists in New England? When he was 10 years old, did he travel the eight miles to Millbury with his father to hear William Lord Garrison lecture on anti-slavery? Did he know what cotton cultivation was like about the whip and what stooping day in and day out does to your back? How could he not know? Even after manumission, did he know sharecroppers made almost no money for their labor, if any, because our government gave former enslaved persons nothing, no reparations, no 40 acres and a mule after they toiled under slavery, they were perpetually indebted to landowners who took their profits from cotton and left them in poverty. Did Gus understand his role in profiting from their exploitation, their misery? How did he square with the hypocrisies between his values and what he did? Or by willful, willful ignorance, did he choose not to understand? I think of Upton Sinclair who said, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. I think of my brother too, your uncle Jim, who for his first job out of graduate school in aerospace engineering, worked for defense contractor Pratt and Whitney, designing engines for fighter jets. He had tried to work for NASA but those jobs are few and competitive. He landed his work a year before 9-11. In the months and years after 9-11, when then President George W. Bush and his, then President George W. Bush and his administration trumped up the cause to go to war with Iraq by telling Americans that Iraq had stockpiled, quote, weapons of mass destruction, unquote. If you look up that phrase, you will find it synonymous with a lie. Initially, your Uncle Jim stood behind the war and ridding the war, the world of Iraq's brutal leader, Saddam Hussein. About Saddam Hussein being brutal, there is ample evidence. I did not argue with my brother over that fact, but he knew I disagreed about the war. I didn't bug him about it though bug someone about something too much and you alienate them. He knew where I stood. Once we were driving on I-90 together, headed to Grandma Taft's house, when Bob Dylan's Masters of War came on. It begins like this. Come you masters of war, you that build the big guns, you that build the death, the death planes, you that build all the bombs, you that hide behind walls, you that hide behind desks, I just want you to know I can see through your masks. Jim got very quiet. He was driving. He didn't argue with Dylan or change the song. He sat through the entire song, an indictment of his own work. I looked over at him to see his eyes wide as he stared ahead. Hmm, he said. 
when it ended, hmm, with a pregnant silence. That summer, we went to Pemaquid Beach together where Grandma Taft, Taft used to take us as kids. It was July 2003. Our country had been at war with Iraq for four months then. He brought a huge engineering textbook with him to the beach. He was studying up for a conference. I can still see that textbook propped up on his legs as he leaned over the white pages, squinting, brow furrowed under a bright sun, when suddenly he turned to me. Erica, I don't think about what I do and what it does, and I don't want to say anything about it, else about it, all right? Okay, I nodded, and then he turned back to his book. Your mom is not innocent either. I am not innocent. I buy gas for our car and heat our house on oil, a war commodity, yet I buy it anyway. Or there's this, the year before you were born, I wore a chiffon bridesmaid's gown to your Aunt Karen's spring wedding. Our cousin Jane was a bridesmaid too. Both of us wrapped in champagne rose amid the columns at the White Jefferson Memorial, doing wedding party photos. When cousin Jane looked at me and said, that dress looks really good on you. I did love the dress and felt good in it too. Then abashedly, trying not to be too serious at a wedding, I said I couldn't help thinking about the seamstress who sewed it together, the opulence of the wedding against the deadly garment factory collapse in Bangladesh must have been on my mind. Over a thousand people killed while making clothes for Benetton, Prada, and Walmart. Jane laughed and waved her hand at me. Yeah, but I bet she'd really appreciate how awesome you look in that dress. I didn't know how to respond. When you question the world and how you live in it, you're often alone. I can only guess at great-great-grandfather's degrees of awareness and denial, and I can imagine that then, as now, that compromising one's values and ideals was thought of as being practical or even unavoidable. When it came to depending on cheap labor, people may have said, as they do today, that's how it is, what's the alternative? From his diaries, I wanted evidence that he could think outside of these common defenses, evidence that he knew he was a part of a violent system from which he gained abundantly. By 1869, Gus Taft had been superintendent of White and Machine Works in Whitensville for five years. He ran the shop, as it was called. He made 5,000 a year that doubled and quadrupled during the 1870s and 80s, depending on the company's earnings. His trip to Western Europe that summer was, in part, was part, partly a scouting mission, excuse me. He toured factories in Britain to glean ideas on how to improve Whiten's own textile machines. Of Sheffield, England, he wrote, quote, Sheffield is a smoky, dirty, but busy town. All seem to be at work, and women and children are all employed in the cutlery establishment and various iron and steel implement factories, unquote. Sheffield had been making knives as early as the 14th century. Gus spoke of English iron and the Bessemer method for steel production, and that one fa factory paid Bessemer, who was an actual person, 140,000 pounds annually for use of his patent. He noted, quote, the immense piles and tiers of armor plates and fortifications for Bermuda and other places was simply enormous, unquote. He did not elaborate on colonial enterprises. Page after page, he marvels at production, not its implications. He traveled south for leisure to Paris where he bought jewelry for his wife, Ruth, and one evening, and I'm quoting him here again, got dinner, then went directly to the Tuileries, 
which were brilliantly lighted up with names and symbols and flame, passing on through the Place de la Concorde, all was brilliant with lights from many thousand burners in ground glass globes, the initials N-E on every burner, Napoleon the Emperor, unquote. With friends from the company, he traveled to Versailles, too, which the flamboyantly decorative Napoleon III had revived. Gus remarked on the miles of paintings and said, as we traverse room after room, we cannot help but think how much the people of France have been robbed to beautify and adorn the environs where kings and queens have made their homes. I want to pause here. To distance oneself from the extortionate taxes monarchs imposed on their people was quintessentially American. The United States, an experiment in democracy, was preoccupied with distinguishing itself from its roots, all the while importing the architecture, finery, and social stratification from the old country. In six years, the construction of the Taft Mansion, which is a mansion that uh, my great-great-grandfather had, had built. So in six years, the construction of the Taft Mansion, a Gothic Victorian with the tower, mansard roofs, and the iron cresting of the French Empire style would be completed. Great-great-grandfather would name it Hillside in honor of Hill Street, where it was situated and where his father, Cyrus, owned so much land, that part of town was known as Taft's Hill. Hillside, the mansion, was not Versailles, but like Versailles, Hillside was a monument to the extravagances of New England's aristocracy, while the poor lived in tenements. According to the 1907 genealogical and personal memoirs of Worcester County, Gustavus Elzefan Taft, again, that's my great grandfather, gave generously to the unfortunate and needy. According to family lore, Hillside had a hidden room that served as a hiding place in the Underground Railroad. Considering that Hillside was built a decade after the Civil War ended, this claim is improbable. Might he have housed refugees from the South when he lived in Holyoke? Might his father have housed him at his place on the corner of Hill and Main Streets and my family is just mistaken? about which house played a role in helping refugees to safety. The Tafts sided with the party of Lincoln. Gus was drawn to abolitionists. Beyond that, I have no evidence our ancestors took those kinds of risks. And without that evidence, it would be unconscionable to claim they possessed that kind of courage. People have lost their lives being that courageous. When my mother's cousin, Laura, first gave me copies of her mother's genealogical research, the Mayflower and Taft family trees and dozens of old photographs, she also gave me a tea set from Gus and Ruth's estate. She'd offered to give me more, but we have neither hutch nor china cabinet, and keeping too many things is unsettling for me. The teacups and saucers are still packed in the cardboard box Laura gave me when I met up with her at a gallery on the wooded hillside outside Charlottesville when her husband had a show there. That fall night, a chill to the air, she wore glasses, thin framed like, thin -framed like spectacles and a workman's button up shirt. I wore a blue cardigan. Laura was shy with me, careful, as if she might make a misstep, or maybe she didn't trust me. Was she unsure of what to say? We hadn't seen each other in 20 years or more, not since I was a girl. When Laura introduced me to her husband, the tall, big-shouldered, white-bearded artist with a glowering face, he gave me a sidelong glance. Nothing more. That was before people had even arrived to gawk at his ma massive canvases. 
Maybe he and Laura had had a fight on the way up from North Carolina. He'd recently broken his arm, so maybe he was in pain. I wondered what it was like for Laura to live with him. She was an artist too. She seemed protective of him and overshadowed, even afraid, making herself smaller as though on the inside, she was hunkering down in a bell-shaped cage but I may have been projecting. What I have are glimpses and intuitions, not necessarily accurate, but with some truth about me and perhaps about the person I see. There is always so much one wants to ask, but can't ask without time enough to sense what a person does and does not want others to know. In many ways, we are such mysteries to each other, each tethered to our own private languages as the heart hungers to the beat of who are you? Who are you? I left at dusk, bumping down the narrow dirt road, my window down, listening to the grains of dirt and rocks pop beneath my wheels, the woods thick in the blue light as if in those woods, we were all so very cocooned. I saw something move in my periphery, something low to the ground, and I stopped. Wild turkeys, a flock of them, spread out, each holding a station as they paused to look back at me. They were so quiet and dignified, wings down, shoulders back. I marveled as they stood there so unquestioning of their territory as they eyed me steadily for any sudden moves. Don't you know you have to be careful, I said to them, though not out loud. November is coming, hunting is coming, careful. They held my gaze and I theirs, and then they turned and began to waddle away unhurried into the forest. As I drove over the Blue Ridge into the valley toward our home, a sense of wonder stayed with me. The moment in the forest with the wild turkeys, so green it radiated, green because such moments do not die. They renew us again and again, as all glimmerings do. These are glimpses into our earthly fellowship whose meaning we can never fully grasp these quiet moments of mystery, these pauses to marvel at creation, what are they but a means to salve pain with beauty? I'm aware of the time here that we have 15 minutes left and I have a page and a half of something to read, but I think I'm gonna pause there. And again, thank you for showing up and um, I'm happy to take any questions if, if anybody has any. And if nobody has any, I'll read. <laughs> um, feel free to unmute yourself if you have uh, questions. I feel like the, the ticker is going. <laughs> um, I, I would like to know, kind of structurally, how you went about incorporating deeply personal stuff with historical stuff. I mean, did you, did you, uh, uh, how, what was the, your, was there technique in that? Or did you just splat it down and rearrange it? Um, what, uh, you know, uh, talk to me about process here. Because it's a really complex narrative. It is, um, and I know there were probably a lot of people to keep track of in that one section, but I really do only have about six main characters in the book, um, and I think all of them were in that passage. Um, I mean, when, I'm, when I write, I just write. I just get it down, and I was, I was putting stuff down as it came to me, especially the scenes that were happening in real time, like with Sadie. Um, and then I was also doing this research. I was going on research trips up to Boston uh, and also to Whitensville, Massachusetts, which is 
where my family lived um, for four generations, um, although they'd been living in, in Western, you know, in Massachusetts, you know, since the Mayflower and then with Robert Taft um, since about 1675, 78. And so I was researching all around there and I was just trying to find a way to I mean, you have to ha get a sense of the music of a piece. And, you know, all, all music has these refrains or the, these moments where you're like, okay, enough doing the chorus. Now it's time to move on to a new verse. And it's kind of like that, you know, you have these themes, you realize what the themes are. And, you know, you, that, that theme will come up in one way or another. And then to push the narrative forward, you, I guess my narrative, especially in the first part of the book, because I think it's going to be in two parts, is a story of discovery about the family. What I discover, its implications for the family, but also in terms of thinking about our country, and trying to, again, speak candidly to my daughter about that, because um, you know, the effects of silences, both about our national story um, and, it, and in our own family, which has a long history of, of you know, abuse and, and trauma. It's, it's with this generation that um, my siblings and I are just speaking more candidly to our, our children and with each other to try to heal from that. And I think again doing that at home is really important and and that it's something that we have to do candidly on a national scale as well yeah martha i don't know if that answers your question i hope you like my song metaphor does that I work yeah yes very <laughs> much okay all right i have a question yes for you, erica yeah. As somebody who has done historical research on my family, going back to the Mayflower as a Hopkins and so forth, I was very frustrated with the paucity that I found from a female perspective. And, mm -hmm. you know, although I, you know, I, I commend what you're, you're doing, um, with the race and ethnicity and class issues. I wonder how for your daughter, you're going to handle the gender social stratification that leaves so many absences in that historical record. That's such a great question. And can you remind me of your first name? So I know who I'm Kathy. addressing. Kathy, Kathy, Kathy Kavanaugh. Um, Kathy Kavanaugh. Yeah. What a wonderful, <laughs> What a wonderful, um, important question. So you're right, there is a real paucity of information about women and certainly women in my family. And um, I will say from the research I've done on, um, for just example, Gustavus's a wife, Ruth, um, you know, she was a part of the, the DAR, the Daughters of the Revolution, and, and she was very much <laughs> in her own writing, because she wrote something for the, um, the centennial of the United States, you know, and also for her town. And it's very, very patriotic um, and nothing really personal, though you can kind of read between the lines. But how I deal with gender and talking to Sadie is not to talk about, well, there are portions that are about the book, in the book that are about my mother and her only sibling, my aunt. So I do talk about them because a lot of the trauma comes down through them and also through their mother. As far as um, talking about sort of histories of women um, in the United States, and I'm thinking about this because you know, yesterday was the 100th anniversary of uh, the 19th Amendment being ratified. And then I think it went into effect on the okay. 26th, which is next week. And, you know, I had mentioned at the beginning of this, I grew up in Rochester, New York. 
and my father uh, just emailed my sister and me yesterday saying that he had ridden his bike past Susan B. Anthony's grave. And, you know, Susan B. <laughs> Anthony is one of the best known um, suffragettes. Um, she's buried in a cemetery directly across the street from my father's house, as is Frederick Douglass. And both those people play a role in the book, but how I tell my daughter about women's history is really through Susan B. Anthony, uh, primarily because she had such oh, an good. effect. She had such an effect on my life. And because I come from Rochester, the town definitely focused on her as the suffragette. Um, and when Sadie and I, that's my daughter, Sadie, um, when we visit Rochester, where both my parents still live, every morning, if it's not downpour raining, we visit both Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. And it's, a wonder, yeah. it's just a wonderful way to walk around with them. But it gives me an opportunity, like those visits to the cemetery are in the book. And it gives me an opportunity to talk about that history. I do think it's just as important though, that traditionally, I think we, I think the United States focuses on white suffragettes. And so I do also try to talk to Sadie about um, other suffragettes, uh, suffragettes of color, um, like Sojourner Truth, who was someone um, who I learned about in church. Um, and who has been with me along the way. So I do also tell Sadie about um, really important suffragettes of, of color and what, and what they've contributed to. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have another question that I'm going to uh, 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 threaten everybody with if you don't come up with one of your own. I know I have friends on this call. You, can, you guys must have a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering, Erica, is the church going to play what kind of a part is that church that you went to growing up going to play? Yeah, so that's my friend Cynthia, whom I've known for, my gosh, Cynthia, at least, years. at least 13 years now. Years. Um, yeah. We met in Iowa City. She's also a wonderful writer. Um, so Cynthia knows that I grew up in a, an African American Catholic church where, where Jesus was black. I mean, I tell people one of the most exciting things about Jesus at my church is that he looked like one of the singers from Earth, Wind and Fire. So he was like super hip. And, you know, if you grow up as a child with that being your Jesus from the beginning, it, it shapes your mind. Um, it does play a significant role in the book because it's a way to give my daughter insight into how my sensibility was formed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I owe so much to that church and so much to the abolition history in Rochester itself. Because that church was an African-American church, we celebrated Black History Month every year. And the children in Sunday school were, they had essay writing contests, which is how I learned about Sojourner Truth because for my, for my submission, I think when I was in fourth or fifth grade, I wrote about her. I will tell you, I feel so sad it wasn't very good because I think I predominantly copied it from an encyclopedia. I didn't know what to do. But it's it, how you learn when you're in fourth grade, right? Right. But I, it has never left my mind. Um, and I've sort of followed her ever since. And she's far more interesting than encyclopedia yeah. <laughs> entry, although I'm happy she's there. Uh, so it's just those kinds of things. Um, you know, because I am very interested in, you know, since this is a book to where I'm speaking to my daughter, like, how are kids educated? Because I can tell you in my predominantly white public school, which was a 
a pretty good public school in Rochester, we did not get that kind of education. So that education came from church where in the homilies, you know, they talked about the civil rights issues of the day. Um, and and that's that's where I got that. And so it it shapes it shapes how this narrator talks to her daughter. Yeah, thanks for asking the question, Cynthia. I also just wanted to say I love the picture of you through the book of you taking um, Sadie to the two graves. I think that's a lovely thing to be incorporating there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, me, me too. Yeah, thanks. I am, am going to ask my question, um, even though we're running out of time. I'm so curious. You've been deep in this project for, what, two years? Three a while. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about it before Sadie was even born in, in April of 2017. Um, but I started uh, setting pen to paper and taking notes probably in June or July of that year. Okay, well, what I, what I want to ask you, if you'll pardon me for uh, 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 riffing on Bob Seeger, <laughs> is what do you know? about yourself now that you're doing this project or deeply in about yourself that you didn't know before you started yeah i think i'll go back to um well there are a lot of things i mean i've been through some life changes since that that i have so many friends on this call you know i i'll just say briefly i have been through a divorce since then. I'm not with Sadie's dad. Um, I, I do not talk to my daughter a whole lot about that in the book, except to acknowledge it um, in large part because I don't think that kids should be burdened with, um, you know, just the, the tensions that are between their parents. I'll just say that. I, it, I grew up with a mom, and this is in the book, who my parents are divorced, who spoke really poorly about my dad to her children and wanted our full loyalty to take her side. And it just caused utter destruction in the family. So um, that's my way of explaining why I'm not going to say anything bad about my ex husband in the book. But, you know, Martha. Um, a question that I can, it related to your question that I can answer more fully goes back to that quote from Toni Morrison that I mentioned earlier is that I didn't realize honestly how important it is to know where you come from going far back. And I know not everyone has access to the kind of documentation that I do, but in the very least, if, if people can be deeply rooted in how their country came about. It just makes you feel far more sane and grounded. And I felt deeply rooted before, but I think it's just a, um, I just feel for whatever reason, being able to level in this way and like take ownership of, of this history uh, with my own family, actually feel much more kind of sane and on steady ground, even though I'm kind of upsetting the family order uh, by talking about these things. I actually feel so kind of clear and sane in my head and as full as I can be in my heart. Like, I think it's a, I think I hadn't known just how much secrecy I was carrying around since I was born. And now I'm just like, <laughs> like Duffy, I feel so free, you know, I feel really good about it. Um, you know, which isn't to say I'm like taking my family onto, I don't even know what the talk shows are this day, Ricky Lake, Jerry Springer, whatever's around. I'm not doing that, you know, I'm trying to be respectful, but also really direct and really clear and it make i i feel good like i i feel like i'm um 
doing something that helps me feel healthier and I'm trying to do something as healthy as I can in my smallest way that I can for this country. Thank you. Uh, it, direct and clear is a great way to go, isn't it? Uh, we're out of time. Barbara, can I lob it back to you? Erica, thank you. I'm sending you a completely sanitary, enormous hug. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody who showed up for this and took time out of your day. And I love seeing your names. If I can't see your faces on there. Um, yeah, I, I wish you all safety and um, health. And um, now you know my politics. And I just say <laughs> November's coming. Let's do this, people. Okay. Let's do this, people. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Erica, so much. We will yeah. convert the recording to a YouTube video and post the link on the Oasis uh, page, a Facebook okay. page. Thank, okay. you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to carrying your book at Oasis too. Okay, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>